presentation is uh, Dr. Robert Kay, who's the medical director of VideoDoc, the main sponsor for today's event. Uh, Dr. Kay is a consultant cardiologist, St. James's and the Beacon Hospital, uh, and he's the director of innovation and of Beacon Health Check at the Beacon Hospital, an entrepreneur and digital healthcare innovator. And uh, now. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to talk. Um, I'm wearing the hat today around telemedicine. Uh, I'm going to give a uh, brief overview of that subject, which follows on very nicely from George's presentation, and also to give uh, some illustrations from a clinical context of where the technology actually enables improvement in healthcare. So the title of this presentation is picked as a new matchmaking vision for the doctor and the patient's relationship. So, as you've all heard from different speakers throughout the morning and throughout the day, that the state of health in Ireland, the same slide applies to Scotland, anywhere else you live, is under significant pressures at every level. In this particular context, it's relevant to the fact that healthcare costs an awful lot of money, it's very difficult to access as a patient, the demands that the patients are expecting on outcomes from the health system are huge, and the resources, the human resources in terms of nurses, doctors, etc., are diminishing in terms of their availability to provide ultimately a high quality service. In particular examples, if you take doctors, say primary care doctors like GPs, also consultants, our time is very limited for the amount of work we have to do. We don't have time to deal with all the complexities around the problems we have. We spend a lot of time answering phone calls at the end of the day, and we spend very little time actually doing the clinical work of looking after patients. The system is also challenged, as I said, because there's very limited resources at every level. There's lots of logistical issues in terms of getting all types of patients to hospital, and that can only have an adverse impact in terms of patient care. If you are a patient, and I think anybody in this room can take this perspective, there are major challenges in terms of accessing the healthcare system as it currently exists in terms of getting near the GP, in terms of getting, say, an ambulance, in terms of getting to see anybody. Patients also are challenged because they have time issues of their own. Everybody's a busy person, everybody has other things on. Healthcare doesn't necessarily hold that priority that maybe it should. In some cases, people do not have the mobility to be able to get to a hospital or to get to see their primary care doctor, and so they need to be able to access treatment from their home. And obviously there are costs associated. Maria mentioned there are differences in costs in terms of how you access healthcare in Ireland, as we all know. And there's a huge convenience factor to patients that comes into play in all of this. And if you are the provider of a healthcare system, be that you are the HSE, you're the Department of Health, you're a hospital, you're a healthcare insurance company, there are clearly issues in terms of the resources that are available and also in terms of the cost of being able to provide those to everybody. So, what I'd like to talk to you about is the attitude of how you try to deal with these problems. These problems have been around for decades, they are the same problems. You need to take a more broader perspective in terms of trying to find a solution to deal with those problems. And I firmly believe, both as a cardiologist but also as a physician, that the role of e-health is enormous. But as Colin Doherty said earlier on, the role of e-health is as an enabler of improving how patient care is delivered. It is not the solution in terms of healthcare and how patient care is delivered. So one aspect of e-health is telemedicine. So telemedicine gives an opportunity where patients can get more convenient access at a much lower cost, and therefore if you support that with the right information for both the patient and the doctor, you will enable the possibility to deliver a much higher quality of care. What's very interesting, as everybody in this room is aware, that there is an increasing faith, as other people have pointed out, amongst everybody to the use of technology. In fact, around the world, 86% of the population are actually online. 100% of people in Ireland actually have a mobile phone. Some people have more than that. And in people globally around the world, which is also very interesting, is that the use of mobile phone amongst people over the age of 50, who most of us associate with the use of the healthcare system, is actually very significant. So there is a great opportunity to link the technologies between that and between healthcare needs. So telemedicine is defined as a remote video consultation between a doctor or any healthcare avenue and a patient. Specifically, according to the US Federal State of Medical Boards, which licenses different aspects of medical practice, 
telemedicine to be an encounter has to constitute certain uh, criteria. So it has to be secure. Security is based on the HIPAA Compliance Act in the US. It has to have the components that you can speak to and see face to face a person. It has to produce a record of the visit. The record can be written, the record can be audio, the record can be some form of connection. It has to produce a record of the visit. And ideally, it should follow the level of best practice and highest quality of care, which the US recognized to be provided both on demand, so acutely, urgently, or as a scheduled visit. It has to have the situation where the physicians are able to see all types of patients, both new and return patients. And then there are the options around whether you integrate uh, telemedicine with electronic medical records. And I think a very important component is the whole education and training aspect for both users and providers. So as a physician or as a doctor or as a GP, what the experience to date is in the US, and this is all available from data that has been published in the last number of weeks, the main reason that doctors want to get involved in using telemedicine as an avenue of doing care is because it improves their capacity to balance their work and their life. There clearly is an opportunity for certain situations to increase revenue as a consequence of using the technology. There is clearly a benefit to the patients in terms of the fact that it connects the doctor and the patient. A lot of patients when they get sick go off to the chemist or go to their friends or go on the internet. They ultimately all end up seeing their GPs. But the problem is some of them don't see them for three months, six months and sometimes longer. The other component of having technology in your practice as a physician is that it makes you more innovative and that is very attractive to patients who see that you're prepared to engage yourself in a broader perspective and makes you more likely to retain their, uh, their needs rather than have them going to other doctors. And I think that's very important as highlighted in the last point. There's a lot of concerns from doctors that they lose their patients as a consequence of technology appearing in other people's practices. Some of the uncertainties that surround this technology is that patients or that doctors are not entirely sure as to what telemedicine is and how it should be used. That's an educational piece, that's a time piece. There is a certain concern about how the reimbursement works. There's an interesting uh, perverse incentive, as some people call it, where the physician might feel that there's greater reimbursement seeing the patient face to face than there is through a telemedicine connection. And there are also some concerns out there that people are concerned when they see a lot of hacking of large organizations that the safety of electronic medical information is not as high as it should be and people are concerned that their medical records might find themselves in other people's hands. And there's also concern from the physician aspect in terms of a lack of training and a lack of knowledge in terms of how this technology is supposed to be embraced. So, as I said to you, there's a lot of data that's already out there. Most of the big pharmaceutical and pharmacy chains in the US and some of the large healthcare organizations, in particular the VA health system, are already using telemedicine. They've been using it for the last number of years. And they have all shown consistently that the use of telemedicine, where appropriate, has the capacity to reduce referral and admissions into the A&E. So any of you in this room who have spent any time in our public hospital system on a trolley, just think about that. There also is the capacity for the GP to control the type of referral and patients that necessarily come to you and sit in your waiting room to be seen. They can be dealt with through other ways. As George has already shown, the VA heart failure system, both from using telehealth, but now from also introducing face-to-face -face telemedicine consults, have shown that they're able to reduce their hospital admissions by an even greater degree. That information and that finding is reproduced in other health systems throughout the US. And there is some data to suggest that that impacts very significantly on patient morbidity and on patient mortality. And most importantly, amongst all these data, it's very clear that patients and the physicians alike are finding that the technology is something to be embraced rather than something to be resisted. So I was asked to present a few cases to put you in the picture as to how this type of technology might be useful to you. And as most of you are not from a direct clinician background, the most useful perspective is probably to put yourself in the position as a patient. So there are a couple of cases I'm just going to show. There's three of them here. This is based on telemedicine as a platform that exists in the US. And you'll see, obviously, the ambulance are called EMS. And obviously, in Ireland, we call 999. But if you take an example here of a patient who gets uh, known asthma, who has an asthma attack at home, calls an ambulance for help, gets an inhaler, and gets better, if you're in Ireland, you get into the ambulance, you get brought into your local hospital, you sit in your A&E, you're probably on a trolley for a few days, you might get seen, and then you might come through the system. 
Unless you go to Dr. Corton's hospital, you might get triage very quickly through the uh, um, medical assessment unit, depending where you land. But in telemedicine setup with this particular service, there is a facility for the ambulance to call into the telemedicine center to make a decision around the patient's care so that the patient can stay at home, the ambulance can go to another call out, and the patient's prescription, in this particular instance, can be filled to the local chemist, the patient can pick up the inhalers that have run out, and the patient can go see the doctor the next day if the necessity arises locally. If you're the parent of a very young child, it's not uncommon for kids to get fevers, for kids to get rashes, you get very worried, you don't know what to do, you know, it's late at night, you can't get the doctor, do you call an ambulance, what do you do? Where you use the triage facility through telemedicine, there is a capacity to use the photograph or use the, the video technology to see the patient, to see the rash, to recognize the diagnosis, to make a treatment decision, and to avoid all the, the, the follow-on where you might end up in an a &E. The third example is a, a more interesting example where, say, the parents of that last case discovers that her father-in-law is unwell. And the father-in-law thinks there's nothing to it. He just has a, he just has a tummy bug, it's dinner, it's, it's nothing to worry about. And the daughter says, well, hang on a second, I use this service, it's very helpful for uh, accessing opinions about managing the situation. And the doctor on the telemedicine service talks the patient through and says, hang on, let's just have a look at the tummy. And you find out there's something seriously wrong with the patient. And then the follow-on from that is that the telemedicine service can call ahead to the hospital casualty so that the patient gets a priority treatment and gets dealt with quickly, doesn't end up queued up in a trolley waiting to be triaged in that situation. So all those benefits clearly show a significant uh, impact in terms of real world, in terms of the capacity where the technology can help patients. If you translate that to what we have in Ireland, you will see that there are loads of examples where telemedicine may be of value. Discharging patients from hospital, there is a big gap between when patients leave hospital and when they actually go back to their GPs. Triaging people for certain things. This is not a replacement for the current level of care that you see from day to day. Managing chronic diseases. One of the diseases that was mentioned earlier on is epilepsy. A lot of epileptics can't drive their cars, they can't get to clinics. There's a great opportunity to see your neurologist through the telemedicine link to discuss your problems, to discuss the side effects, he can see you. You can do the same visit every year. And there's loads of other examples. Big benefits as well for the doctors. You know, the doctors, by being able to communicate more easily with consultants, by being able to share information with other doctors, there's a great capacity both for education, for information, and also for continuous medical education. So I'd like to show a video for you that just really points out, the video lasts for three minutes, just to highlight you exactly what the service looks like in real. It's very easy for me to talk about it. This is based on an emergency care telemedicine platform that exists in North Carolina called ReliMD, and I'm just gonna play it here. Hi, I'm Dr. Seth Warren, a physician from Hawaii. Nice to meet you. How can I help you today? Uh, it has to be symptoms for about a week now. Um, at first, I thought it was a cold or something like this. And I just didn't sit in the teeth that I have to leave all of these games to the doctor. I'm Dr. Ken Singletary. How are you doing today? Well, I, I play tennis three or four times a week, and I've uh, never had much of a problem. But there's been a persistent ache in my shoulder, down my elbow. And I didn't get real bad until you know, 2 a.m. and in the meantime I rolled over and brought tears in my eyes. So I picked my son up from school and the moment we got home we were packing up to head to the mountains for the weekend. And we were about to walk out the door and he said, I'm itchy. And I looked down and he was covered in hives. I called urgent care. They said there was a one hour wait. Um, so I called the lion D and was able to, to get on with him. 10 minutes. Getting online with a physician who you may or may not have seen before is a little bit unnerving, but once you get on there, you start having the first few minutes of getting to know one another and you ask, you're answering questions, it becomes very natural. And at the end, almost every single person who has used it for the first time says, that was so easy, so convenient, and it basically laid all their fears. It was really easy. Dr. Park was super friendly and was able to talk him through what he needed to do in terms of showing him his hives and uh, checking out his throat so that it was an easy experience. Based upon your examination of your symptoms, it does seem like it's most consistent with sinusitis. It's very similar to what you might expect at a doctor's office or, or even urgent care now. Um, it's a little bit different in the sense that you're going to be you know, talking to your tablet or your phone or maybe a computer and that the person that you're interacting with isn't right there next to you. 
One of the things about telemedicine that I think is really helpful and unique is that it's more of a collaborative type of evaluation. And it may be that we will have the patient walk across the room or sit down in a chair and stand up and do certain exercises that we would do with them if they were standing in front of us. And then once we get a good sense of what's going on, if you need it, we'll call in a prescription to your preferred pharmacy. That's done through an e-prescribed system. It's very quick and convenient. And I would say usually it takes all of anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes from start. Any of your local pharmacy any address, and I'll be happy to call in a prescription so that it's waiting for you when you arrive. That I didn't have to actually wait in town to, to work with my local pharmacy. Uh, Dr. Park was able to call the prescription in. The place that we were going it was a three hour drive that I was about to get on the road and, and just made a phone call. And, and so by the time we got into town, the prescription was, was waiting for us. We're North Carolina doctors taking care of North Carolina patients and that's something that we're proud of. I like that people can continue going about their daily business or stay at home at night and have the satisfaction of knowing that their loved one or they themselves uh, are going to be okay. What I was hoping for was to make sure that we weren't facing something serious but, but do so in a way that was fast um, and convenient and in the case that it wasn't serious but we could get on with our weekend. Helps to illustrate for you what telemedicine is about. So, Video Doc, I should tell you, is an Irish company. It's a startup that is bringing a very similar telemedicine platform into practice in Ireland. Uh, the plan is to initially roll the platform out amongst the primary care community throughout the country, uh, with the capacity for GPs throughout the country to be able to do their own telemedicine services. Um, it's fully HIPAA compliant. It's fully secure. Um, and it's based around the platform that you just observed in the last video. And there's a very interesting comment around the last paragraph on the slide from the National Institute of Health in the US, who highlight the fact that if you get patients more engaged through technology and innovation in high quality care at low cost, they are much more likely to derive positive outcomes and better quality of care. So I'd just like to finish by saying to you that telemedicine represents an enormous opportunity for all stakeholders. I'd highlight that it enables better patient engagement, which has been a huge subject of discussion here today. It has the capacity to reduce admissions to hospital A&Es. It improves the relationship between the patient and the doctor. And that means that patients do much better, they're much happier. Employers do much better because their employees are working and not out on sick leave. And the doctors are happier in doing it. So if anybody has any questions, I'll take them at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you. questions about how the model works well in the US, you work in Ireland, and those are questions I think Maria Quinlan's research is, is, is addressing, and similarly how the Scottish model, uh, which is again very different from Ireland, how the things that they're trying to do work in an Irish context where we have a different private public mix and our GPs are, our GPs are um, self-employed and so on and so forth, which maybe the, the speakers want to address in their answers. But I'll put it out to the floor now if there are questions for our panellists. So here in the front. Uh, thank you. Actually, I had a question uh, at the beginning of your presentation. Is that that in how many, in which proportion of uh, visits between a doctor and a, a, a physician you need to have a physical examination? But actually, your video gave us uh, yet another idea, which is that the patient themselves they can do the examination. But maybe you can elaborate a bit that. And the second question then, uh, coming from the EU perspective again, is that you are now launching your platform in Ireland. Are you ready to deliver services, for example, the Irish uh, expat community in Brussels? So, thank you very much. Um, in answer to your question, the most recent body of evidence would suggest that about 70% plus of the patients to physician contacts do not require physical examination. Now, the interesting thing around patients and doctors when you go to see your doctor is telemedicine is not there to replace certain medical problems. So if you think you're having a heart attack, telemedicine is not the avenue to contact the doctor. You call the ambulance immediately and you get picked up that way. But a lot of people's conditions that they present to A&E, whether to their doctor with, are largely less urgent situations that are well dealt with. 
You can also see from a very good illustration there where people think there's nothing significantly wrong with them, even engaging with the service can help to detect things quicker. In terms of the service uh, being available and rolling out across Europe, the service is planned. It's planned to start in Ireland to go to the UK, and there are already engagements with the wider Irish community actually in the Middle East at the present time. But the Irish community in Brussels, I'd be delighted to talk to you about after this presentation. Okay, other questions? Oliver? In relation to that child with the rash thing, I personally, as a GP, would like to know that this child had negative positive curing sign. You know, I would like to exclude meningitis. What happens if you miss these things? Um, so, if we go back to what I said earlier on, so we make a diagnosis based on examination, history examination, tests. I think that Maria raised very interesting points around the user engagement with technology, new technology, with doctors and with patients. I think it's very important when you roll out new technology, say to GPs, you have to work with them through the different types of patients, probably starting off with patients that you know already. So for example, taking chronic disease management patients, using them first. Then I think you have to get comfortable with the technology and work out whether you have the capacity to manage your patients like those patients that are mentioned, so that you are well familiar with the types of questions you should be asking, examination, and being able to identify if there are causes that you're concerned about that will lead you to try out the patients in the local a &E. But I do think it's important to work through GPs and other users on an individual basis because I think there is an exposure if everybody just goes out there and starts using it for those, for the wrong reasons that you've just identified. Well, I would consider myself uh, confident enough to ask those specific questions now. But in relation to the 30, 70 percent, how do you know which, which division you're in? Can I answer this? An unbiased thing, I mean, you may not know, NHS 24 is Scotland's national uh, telephone triage service. Um, we triage 1,700,000 calls. So after our GP surgery shuts, everyone phones 111 in Scotland, we come to my service. And so we do telephone triage. We don't have the ability to video, con uh, video consult yet, but we'll do. Uh, we have a new system that goes live later this year. Um, You've got to recognise, as you do, that there are limitations in everything. Telephone triage can screen off 50% to self-care without going anywhere near a health professional. And you recognise you then have to only prefer another proportion. So in the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare that I'm responsible for, we've done research looking to see what enhancement you get from using the video consulting. And it actually does make a significant difference as another cohort you can take on. But the most important thing is that there are cases where you do need to lay a hand on an abdomen and you do need to physically touch and examine a patient. And part of, of this is not just giving people the technology and saying on you go. There's actually an education and training program that has to sit round about it, both in terms of how you do a video consultation, because it's different uh, to face to face in surgery, um, and also you have to understand the limitations. So it's like you and your consulting room. You do not have all the equipment that you have in an A&E department. And when we put A&E consultants into a general practice surgery, they're quite unsettled because they can't do lab tests and there's not an X-ray equipment or an ultrasound scan sitting in the corner of the room. It's all horses for courses. So what we're saying is that it is a very powerful tool. We, are, we understand the limitations, but it always does have limitations. And we must not ignore that. Ignore that in your peril, because you're right. Um, well, let me let me put it this way. What I can say is that the, the our service in the last quarter we had three hundred and eighty thousand contacts, and we had sixteen upheld complaints and no fatalities. 